All right. Uh, thanks a lot. So uh, who's the pizza guy? There's a pizza guy. Um, I'm going to finish at 12 today because I have to go to a meeting back at Imperial. So is that what I'm supposed to tell you? So you know when to... All right. Um, all right. So I want these lectures to be uh, uh, relaxed. I want you to ask me lots of questions. I have a sort of set of things that I was going to talk about. But if we end up talking about other things, that's absolutely fine. So I want you to interrupt me when things don't make sense. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, the, the basic thing I'm going to talk about is sort of, uh, I think I called it geometry and fluxes. So um, let me tell you what the kind of idea is behind the lectures. So in some sense, I'm just going to tell you about a little bit of maths that you may already know, which is something called G-structures. And that's a nice way, right, so geometry, what do I mean by a geometry? What I mean is, You've got a manifold, and then on top of it, you put something, like a metric, or a complex structure, so you can have complex coordinates, or something. And of course, that sort of thing appears all over the place in physics, right? We're always doing that. Um, and what we'd like is to have some sort of, what might be helpful would be to have sort of some bit of maths that helps us talk about all those different kinds of geometries in the same language. So what, what I mean is like, you might be interested on a manifold which is a Lie group, right? That's got lots and lots and lots of structure on it. You might be interested in a manifold with a metric. You might be interested in doing some string compactification and you're interested in a manifold which has a Calabi-Yau metric on it or something called a G2 metric or a Hyperkähler metric or a Sasaki-Einstein metric or a quaternionic Kähler metric or a contact structure, or a, right? There's all these things that appear when, for example, you're interested in doing compactifications of string theory, but they appear in all sorts of other places. So one thing I'll try and do is tell you a language in which you can understand those different structures. And then I'm going to um, talk about the fact that, and this is motivated by string theory. So in string theory, right, you live in 10 or 11 dimensions. We want to live in four, so you have to do some kind of compactification. And typically, you want the compactification to, for example, preserve some supersymmetry so that your four-dimensional theory is still supersymmetric. So one of them is going to be just motivated by phenomenology. What if you want to compactify on a space and preserve supersymmetry in four dimensions? What does that tell you about the geometry? The second one will be um, ADS-TFT. What if you wanted to do some uh, ADS geometry? Um, and so, so, so let, me, let me write these down explicitly. So the first, so the sort of the physics motivation is the, the three things that I'm going to sort of focus on. So one is sort of phenomenology, not really, but motivated by phenomenology. So that's where we imagine we have a space time which looks like, you know, uh, our 4D universe times some manifold, some internal manifold. And say you want to have supersymmetry in 4D. What does this imply about M? What does that tell you about that compactification space? So if this was in, this might be compactifying the 10-dimensional string, in which case it would be six dimensions, or the M theory, in which case it would be seven dimensions. So that's one motivation. The second motivation is going to be ADS-CFT. So there we're going to have, say, some ADS d plus one dimensional space times some internal geometry. And that's supposed to be dual under ADS CFT, right, to some d dimensional, say, superconformal field theory. So again, if this is a superconformal field theory with some number of supersymmetries, what does it tell you about this geometry? And just as a kind of picture, right, I'm going to be talking about differential geometry, right? That's basically what we're going to be doing. So this say, if you think about ADS-CFT in terms of geometry, when you think about it here as some compactification, you're doing some differential geometry. If you think about it in the, in the conformal field theory, right, you've got a load of operators, you've got operator product expansions, you've got a sort of algebra of operators. So actually, in some sense, this is differential geometry. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. And this is actually a reformulation of the same thing in algebraic geometry. So differential geometry, right? You think of the manifold as being points. 
algebraic geometry, you think of the space as being defined by all the functions you can put on the space and their algebra. So in some sense, from a geometrical point of view, the ADS-CFT correspondence is a relation between a differential description of some geometry and an algebraic description of some geometry. And then the third thing uh, I'm going to focus on um, is um, what are called consistent truncations. Um, so that's probably best uh, explained by considering an example. So let's think about a really simple system, which is just two fields, each with their own mass. So I'll have some heavy field phi, and I'll have some light field chi. And let's suppose we had some interaction between them, some cubic interaction, which looks like kappa phi squared chi. OK, so suppose I had those two scalar fields. And what you would normally say is, OK, if the capital mass squared is much bigger than the little mass squared, then as I come down in energy, at high energy, I can excite both fields. When I get to lower energy below this mass squared, I can't excite this phi field. And it's reasonable to uh, integrate it out if you did the path integral, or classically just sort of it won't get excited. And so I can just focus on the chi field. That's a hierarchy, right? So if we have a hierarchy of masses, where this mass squared is much smaller than this squared, then at low energies, we get an effective theory of just the um, chi field. Um, now, a consistent truncation is something different. So that might be like a kaluza klein compactification, right? You might get all these fields coming from kaluza klein modes. And so when you go to low energies, you just keep the massless mode, the lowest line. A consistent truncation is something different. A consistent truncation is a truncation to a subset of fields where every solution to that subset is automatically a solution to the full set. So let's think about that. So if I write down the equations of motion, I'm going to have something like uh, d squared minus m squared phi looks like uh, kappa 2 kappa phi chi. And if I look at the d squared minus m squared chi, that looks like, I hope I get this right way around, uh, 2 kappa phi squared. I wrote it exactly the wrong way around. Let me change that. Sorry about that. Um, so now I get 2 chi squared. I hope I get this right. OK. All right, so now imagine if you try and turn off one of the fields. So um, uh, if you turn off chi squared, right? Um, then these, re these equations just reduce to the wave equation for phi. If I try and turn off phi, this will reduce to the wave equation for chi, but here I get a contradiction, right? Because this would be zero, but it's, it's sourced by chi. So I can make a consistent truncation which is to set uh, chi equal to 0. So yes, yeah, sorry, this, I should now say we only keep the phi field, right, because I changed the masses. Uh, sorry, no, that was right. I need to change my man. No, OK, good. I'm fine. All right, so um, I can make a consistent truncation where I turn off chi, but I can't truncate, so there's no consistent truncation. So, uh, so this one's OK, but if I time set phi to 0, that's bad. Um, precisely because chi sources 
the Phi field. So when I make the, when I think of it as a uh, effective theory, that's fine, it sources it, but I need to get a lot of energy in order to turn it on because this mass is large. But if I'm not making that approximation, if I really want solutions here to exactly be solutions, I'm only allowed to uh, set the chi field to zero. And then I get a theory of the phi field, right? So I get just d squared minus m squared uh, phi is zero. Even though um, the field I turned off, so if here I have to turn off the light field and I get a consistent theory of the heavy field. Okay, so it's not an approximation in that sense, it's just an exact thing. So why could I do this? Well, there's actually a symmetry reason. There's a symmetry, there's a Z2 symmetry, which sets phi to, um, phi goes to phi, and chi goes to minus chi. And what we're doing is we're keeping the singlet, so we keep the singlet field, which is phi. And if we keep all the singlet fields, right, singlets can only source singlets, so it's consistent. If we try to keep the chi field, which, trans, um, which transforms, then the chi field could source things that uh, don't transform, transform in other ways. So the reason you can make this truncation is because there is a, there's a symmetry reason. Okay? Do people have questions? Yeah. Maybe a silly question. But Please. So this is exploiting symmetric criticality. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so what I'm interested in here is what if you have a theory which doesn't have a hierarchy? Is there still some set of fields you can keep consistently? So um, that's an interesting question because... Um, we, at the moment, um, so this is relevant to ADS CFT because uh, there seems to be, there seems to be no hierarchy between the ADS scale and the curvature scale of M, right? There's two, we've got ADS times M, and there's two different uh, curvature scales there, one for ADS, one for M. In the examples we know, they're the same. So there's no sense, so there's no, so there's no nice Kaluza-Klein approximation, right? Keeping just the lowest lying states here is not justified because the next level will be the same order as the ADS as the ADS scale. However, there can be there can be consistent truncations. And what that corresponds to is keeping some subset of the operators in the field theory such that if we're in the large end limit, their OPE closes amongst themselves. That's the same state. Okay? And that's interesting because you might be interested, it might be that it's too complicated to do the full problem, but by thinking in some consistent truncation, you can get some useful things. And in fact, if you're trying to do, really, if you're trying to do bottom-up physics, if you're trying to just have some effective theory that you then say gives you some nice ADS to CFT description, you better really hope that it sits in a consistent truncation, or otherwise you're not going to. Not going to be able to justify what you're doing. Okay, are there more questions? Okay. Yeah, please. That there had nothing to do with this hierarchy. No, so so the so the thing, yeah, I probably didn't stress it well enough, right? So the interesting thing here is, if you're doing the hierarchy, you just keep the light field. Yeah. But in the in the what if these masses were about the same? You wouldn't know which one to keep. But in fact, there is a consistent way of keeping one of them. That's the point. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, 
Um, and then although my, you know, my motivation here is coming from problems in string theory, I think as I said, like these kind of structures appear all over the place, right? So um, these kind of special geometries, right, appear in uh, thermodynamics, if you want, right? Thermodynamics is really geometrically a theory of what are called contact structures. Um, if you want to do um, types of cosmology, like Bianchi cosmologies, right? They're really just uh, doing things on Lie groups that have structures like this. Uh, if you're interested, if you're a mathematician, you're interested in the moduli space of solutions of differential equations, they typically have extra structure on that moduli space, which for a physicist comes from the supersymmetry. So there's lots of reasons you might be interested in these kinds of structures. Okay, so, and, so, um, and, and I should stress that typically the reason we're going to get these interesting geometries is because of supersymmetry. Not always, but often that's what's going to happen. Okay? Okay, that's my introduction. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, there's a little bit more of introduction. So um, I also want to say, what, what, so let me just give a little bit of context. So this is actually the second part. I didn't write 1.2, uh, uh, which is, I just want to remind you or tell you a tiny bit about supergravity because that's often what we're going to be talking about or well, that's what we're going to talk about when we have these fluxes. So let me just remind you about two different things. So d equals 11 supergravity. Right? It's a unique theory. Supergravity, right? It's just gravity together with a local supersymmetry. You've got a, you can do a su different supersymmetry transformation at each point in the manifold. So what do we have? So we have space-time is a, um, technically a spin manifold. We'll probably talk a little bit about that. Um, what that means is that you've got some SO10-1 uh, Clifford algebra. Sorry. Yeah. Who didn't sign this sheet yet? It came back to me already four times and not everybody's name on it. Did you sign? I can't see your name. I'm not going to say another word until everyone has signed the sheet. <laughs> Sorry. Everybody okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> So we have some Clifford algebra, which is just some gamma matrices, right? And actually we have, well, and then, then, then we have a spinner bundle. S, that's just, you know, a set of spinners for these gamma matrices. And let me just remind you what the fields are. So, for the bosons, we have a metric which I'll write just, this is just, I'm just doing this for notation. This is some section of symmetric, right? Symmetric, two symmetric down indices, T star indices. We have a three form, so that's the metric. We have a three form which is a three-form. Uh, and then for the fermions, we have the gravitino. So what's that? That's something which has a down uh, one-form index, and it also has a spinner index, right? Spin three halves, so it's got both a sort of vector and a spinner index. Okay, now let me remind you that this three form is not really globally defined. It's like a potential. So there's really a global field strength, F, which is dA. So I'm using like exterior, right, the exterior derivative. I hope everyone's happy. Um, and what that means is that actually we have some patching. So if you've got two patches of the manifold, on their intersection, 
I can relate the two gauge fields by a gauge transformation. Right? These are three forms. The gauge transformation is a two form. If this was just electromagnetism, you'd stop. You'd have to do some consistency over triple patching, and then you'd stop. Because this is a two form, you can actually keep going. So on the triple overlap, these guys are related to each other by some further transformation by a one form. It's sort of gauge transformations for gauge transformations. And if you keep going, on the quadruple overlap, then there's some relation for these guys. And I'm really just doing uh, permutations here, keeping track of the sign. K L I. Minus what am I doing? J K L. This is some D number one and J K okay. Three forms, two forms, one form. This is finally a scalar. And then there's some consistency on quintic overlaps. This structure, just so you know, is what a math mathematicians call a jerk. Um, or who speaks French? Gerbe. <laughs> Every French mathematical thing, right, is some reference to either corn or fields or something, right? So, like, that's that. Anyway. Um, and what it does is, in the same way, if you did a U1, so you should sort of compare this to a U1 bundle. That's sort of the analog of what we're doing. If it was just one dimension, if it was this was a this was a one form, um, and what this structure does is that it, c it can it can quantize the the field strength. Okay, so in the same way that for a U one bundle, right, the magnetic flux is quantized. This is the same idea. So this structure ends up you can arrange it so that this thing becomes quantized. And that just counts the number of brains that source it, right? That's the idea, the number of objects that can source it. OK, so that's one subtlety, which we won't really have to talk too much about, but I just thought I'd tell you. Um, and then, Sorry. yeah. Is that, is all this just coming from it being a higher form gauge field? Or yeah, that's the, that's the idea. And you might ask, right, how could I make this non-abelian? That would be a kind of cool thing to do. That's tricky. An interesting but tricky problem. Um, there's another way you can think about it if you want, um, which is as an ordinary connection on a space of loops in the space, which is sort of well. And this well, if it was, a, if this was a sorry, if this was a two form, if it was like the thing that appears in string theory. But, are there other questions? So, what's the connection on this space? I mean, which field? Or which Sorry, so if it was, here I had a, here I had a three form, so I better take this to now be a two form. And um, if I think about a connection on loop space, I can then sometimes, if I set it up rightly, then that descends to an object on the space itself, and you can get this structure that way. Yep. Are there other questions? All right, so let me just say a couple of other things. So uh, we have the bosonic action. And that looks like ordinary gravity. And then you get a kinetic term for this gauge field. And then there's this 1, 6, A, wedge F, wedge F. So it's got something that looks like a Chern-Simons term. Uh, and if we get there and talk about the generalized geometry, we'll see how this term is, is encoded. And then if you do the supersymmetry, so the supersymmetry variations, so the variation of the bosons 
will look like some fermions. Let's ignore that for the moment. What about the variation of the fermions? And they look like something that looks like the following. So you get the ordinary levi trevita So this is all going to act on some spinner, right? Because there's going to be some spinner that parameterizes the supersymmetry variations. There's going to be some derivative in this variation. The thing you get here is the levi civita connection, right? The connection that you get from gravity, right? The Christoffel thing with Christoffel symbols. And then you get a correction to it, which depends on uh, I'm not going to lift myself enough space, but it depends on the flux. Okay, so what am I doing here? So I'm introducing some gamma M1 through MP, which is just an anti-symmetrized product of gamma matrices. Right? And then here I have downstairs M, N1 through N4 upstairs. So this is five gammas anti-symmetrized. I've lowered one index. Here it's just a delta, and I get something with three, three indices, and then I contract it with the F. But don't worry too much what it is. There's some operator here. There's some kind of differential operator. And you might ask, is there some kind of geometrical way of understanding the appearance of F and the form of that operator? Right? For, for the levi civita connection, we know what it is. We know it's the thing that the derivative of the metric vanishes and it has no torsion. Right? We know what that object is. Is there some geometrical way of understanding this operator? So one of the kind of questions, is there a geometrical way of understanding this operator? Um, and can we sort of, uh, can we geometrize the flux? That's the other sort of question you might be interested in. Okay. Um, let me just quickly say, um, We also have, why don't I quickly write down something about the other supergravities we might be interested in. So typically the other thing we're going to be interested in is type 2 supergravity, which is, which there's uh, 2A and 2B. And now we're in, so now M is a 10-dimensional spin manifold. Uh, and now we sort of have two spin bundles, S plus and S minus, and they have different chirality. So just as you can have chiral things in four dimensions, you can have chiral things in ten dimensions. Everyone happy? Um, and then what are the fields? So now I have to make a longer list. So the bosons. Uh, there's the metric. Uh, there's a dilaton, which is some function. Right, this just means a function on the manifold. And then there's a B field, which is a two form. It's got a field strength H, which is dB. Um, and then one way of formulating it is that you get polyforms. 
So let's call them A. And this is what distinguishes type 2B and type 2A. So they can either be um, odd forms. So I write a minus sign. So that means one forms, three forms, five forms, seven forms, nine forms. Or they can be even forms. Zero forms, two forms, four forms, six forms, eight forms, ten forms. Um, and if they're uh, odd forms, that's type 2A. And if they're even forms, that's type 2B. Uh, these are the never Schwartz, never Schwartz fields. These are the Ramond Ramon fields. Okay. And then there are some fermions. And sorry, you get two gravitini. So I'm going to label them confusingly with plus and minus. Uh, and they're sections of. Um, if it was type 2A, they're like one forms tensor, the plus or minus bundles, the two different chiralities. If it's type 2B, there's two of them, but they both have the same chirality. And then my conventions, they'll be the plus chirality. So for type 2A, the plus 1 is a plus chirality. The minus 1 is a minus chirality. For type 2B, the plus 1 and the minus 1 are both plus chiralities. And then there's some dilatini. I'll call them rho plus minus. And they are sections either of S minus plus or S minus. This is 2A, 2B, 2A, 2B. OK? So now we have a whole load of form fields, right? There we had just one form field. Now we've got all these form fields. Um, and there are again some SUSY variations, which I won't write down. And these define new operators. So the question again is, is there a way of geometrically understanding what these operators that appear here are? OK, so that's probably enough background. So that's enough, like sometimes I'll refer to an example, and we might be in type 2A or type 2B or in 11-dimensional supergravity. Is that OK with everyone? Any questions? How many like, supercharges are there in two ways? Excellent. So these are all maximally supersymmetric. So everything here has 32 supercharges. Yeah, if you had, so in 11, that's unique. In 10, you get these two possibilities. If you had 16 supercharges, you'd be in type, two, type 1. You can also have some gauge fields. That's more like the heterotic theory. OK. So let's start now talking a bit about these G structures and how that's a useful way of understanding the kind of geometries you can have. OK, so this is sort of the second thing we're getting. The first thing was introduction. I'm now going to talk a little about G structures and uh, compactification. And the idea is I'm going to set up some maths, and then we're going to see how it can describe different backgrounds we might be interested in. And we'll then try and connect it to the, to the supergravity. So let's just start. So let's start. So I'll start with just telling you what a G structure is, which you may have already seen, some of you. I don't know. Possibly. So um, we start with just some differential geometry. So we got some manifold M. And I'm going to have a tangent space. Let me just T of M. And I'm going to have vectors, which are going to be some section of the tangent space. And you know I could write them as some 
v of x, and that's going to look like some vm of x d by dxm. So this is a base part, this is a coordinate basis. And then I might have one forms t star of n that would have some down index and some dx basis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so the first thing you want to do is to think about the frame bundle. So what, what's the frame bundle? So um, one can define a frame um, at a given point in the manifold. So what do I mean by that? I just mean some set of... Um, which, if you like, I can think of them as some E, A, N, D by D, X, M, some set of vectors at that point that live in a tangent space at that point that form a basis. Right? That just means that any vector, we can write any vector as a linear combination of these guys. Right? So it just needs to be linearly independent at that point. So if I have any two frames, so any two frames are going to be related by some, did I say, let's say this is d-dimensional, some d-dimensional manifold. So any two frames are going to be related by some just general linear transformation, right? So one set of frames, the new ones will be related to the old ones by some elements of GLD, right? That's just going from one basis to another, right? Totally trivial. So then you can define f of x, which will make the set of all frames at x. Right, so each one in that set is related to another one by GLD transformation. And then you can think about the frame bundle. So this is going to be, you know, a vector bundle. So the frame bundle, I'll call it f of m. That's just the union over all the points in the manifold of each of these sets, right? So at each point, I have the set of all the frames. So you can think about this. Here's my manifold. And my point in a fiber above each one is a particular choice of frame, right? So if I had a section of this bundle, it would be telling me how my frame varied as I moved along the manifold. Now, um, so typically, right? You can't choose a frame generally. You can't choose a frame across your whole manifold. If you could, right, imagine I've got a manifold and I can choose a frame across the whole manifold. Can you imagine I can just choose one component of the frame, E1. And I can just choose that vector field across the whole manifold so it doesn't vanish anywhere. You know you can't do that, for example, on a two-sphere. That would mean you could choose a vector field that was nowhere vanishing on a two-sphere. That's called the hairy ball theorem. You can't do it, right? At some point, the vector field has to collapse. So if I have my two-sphere and I start drawing a nice vector field that goes nicely around the equator, and I try and smoothly continue it into the rest of the space, at some point, it's going to have to collapse down to a point. There's no way I can draw it everywhere. There's a topological obstruction. 
So that's just to write one vector field, right? To write a frame, I'd have to write two vector fields on this space. So generally, a global frame. So quite generally, you can't write down global frames on a given manifold. If you can, it's called, it's called a parallelizable manifold. So typically, one cannot choose a global frame. So instead, you only have a um, local basis. So if I'm on some open subset, then I can have some I can have some frame here. Frame of sections. And then on that on that little local area, I can write my general vector as an expansion in terms of that frame. But in general, when you go from one patch to the other, you're gonna to have to patch by a GLD transformation. Right? So geometrically, Fm is what's called a principal bundle. Um, and that's a bundle where uh, the fibers are um, form a group. And the reason that works here, right, is I told you that any one frame was related to another one by GLD transformation. So just fix one frame, then you can think of every other point, every other frame as being associated to a GL, to an element of the group GLD. And you can do group multiplication, which is just like, I take my fixed frame, transform it to one, and then I transform it again to another one. So, formally, I can think of this frame bundle as being a principal bundle uh, with a group G, where here, the group G is just the GLD group. And what's happening here is like GLD is the structure group of the tangent bundle. It's telling you, right, how, what does the, when I move around the manifold, how does the tangent bundle twist? And generally, I have to twist it by things that live in GLD. When I patch from one thing to another, I have to do a GLD transformation. Is everyone good? All right, so having set that up, let me now tell you what a G structure is. So what's a G structure? So given uh, a proper subgroup, well, given this, I'll just say a subgroup in GLD, then our definition is uh, a G structure P is a subbundle is a G subbundle P at the frame bundle. So what that means, i.e., its fibers are the group G. So now instead of having frames that are related by the full GLD transformation, we just have sets of frames that are related by a subgroup. 
So what this, what this is doing is that we're picking out a subset of frames. So IE, P at the point X, picks out a subset of frames Px inside uh, Fm at x related by G subgroup of GL dr transformations. Okay? So there is a special set of frames. So IE, so this means if we have one set, if we have two sets, and they're both elements of Px, then E prime A is some transformation of E, where now M lives in the group G. Any two frames are related by a G transformation rather than a GLD transformation. Okay, that might seem a little uh, obscure. It's actually really, really familiar to things you've already known. So let's do, so first, are there any, exa any questions? Yeah. Is there, is there an intuitive reason why the definition doesn't restrict to normal subgroups? Or like, will, that, will there be certain cases where that's Um. Oh, why, uh, sorry, the question was, why am I choosing a subgroup here, or no? Why, why are you not going further and choosing a normal subgroup? So oh. Mm. Yeah, there's plenty of cases where it's not. It's just that, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could. It'd be interesting. But it's not. It's, it, yeah. Um. So let me give you the first example. Which is just that an OD structure is the same as a metric. Right, so when I'm saying formally I call it an OD structure, but it's really just a metric. So let's go in the direction this way. If I have the metric, how do I get the structure? So we have a metric. So we have some, you know, uh, GMN. We can uh, choose P of X to be the set of orthonormal frames. Um, so that's just all, this, all the frames. Uh, I think I called it FX, didn't I? Sorry. Um, such that when I take, when I contract them with the metric, I just get delta. Right? That's a special set of frames. They're the ones that are orthonormal. So where each, each where the length of each vector is one and they're orthogonal to each other with respect to the metric. So uh, I mean here I just mean in components. Right, I'm just contracting up the, 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 the vectors with the metric. Okay, so that gives me a special set of frames. And furthermore, any two frames here. So these two are going to be related to each other. Uh, if and only if, like, M, M transpose is the identity, right? I just make this transformation, stick it in here. It has to preserve this delta AB, this fact that it's, they're orthonormal. That tells me that M has to live in the... Uh, 
So i m is an element of the orthogonal group. So we get a set of frames, and they're related to each other by orthogonal transformations. So sort it's of trivial, right? All right. Now, what if we wanted to go the other way? Uh, so from the structure to the matrix. So you just have to work a little bit harder. So we can find the dual basis or the dual frame E A, which live in the cotangent space, and they're just defined by E A M. E hat M B is just delta A B. So they're just they're one forms that when you contract with the vectors you get zero. Or equivalently, E A M is just you lower an index on the on the uh, using the metric on the on the on the vector frames. And then you can construct the metric. It's just delta A B E A M. EBN. These are just uh, field binds, right? And again, this construction is independent of the choice of orthonormal frame. And what's going on here is that the metric, the metric is invariant under this OD subgroup of GLP. Right? That's what's going on. The, the metric is like an invariant quantity with respect to this structure. OK, so uh, let's keep going. So let's do another example. So suppose I have some SLDR. structure that corresponds to an orientation. So let me call it kappa. So how do I do that? So I can just construct some, I can either think it, well, maybe it's better to do it as a form. Okay. I can construct some form, a D form, right? So it's a top form. And I can just construct it by taking my frame, actually the dual frame, and just contracting it with the epsilon tensor, where this epsilon is you know, epsilon 1, 2, 3, up to D is plus 1, and it's totally anti-symmetric. Right? This thing's like taking the determinant of the frame. So to preserve it, I have to have things that preserve the determinant, so I get some SLD. Right? So an orientation is something where you have a top form that's defined everywhere on the manifold. Right? It means your frame, as you go around, its handedness can't change. That's what this is saying. This is a topological condition. So not all manifolds are orientable. Right? The Mobius strip. Can't do an orientation on a Mobius strip. So unlike the metric, you can put a metric on any manifold. Uh, on the orientation, 
To have this structure, it's actually a topological condition on the manifold. Okay. Let me do another example. So what if we have uh, D is 2n, so I'm going to assume I'm on an even dimensional manifold, and I take a GLNC structure. That thing corresponds to an almost, what's called an almost complex structure. So we're heading here towards complex manifolds. Complex manifolds are things where you can have coordinates on the manifold that are complex uh, functions, right? Complex coordinates rather than real coordinates. So, right, you can always embed the complex general linear transformations in the real general linear transformations of one dimension higher. How do you do that? You need a notion of what I is, right? So. So we can embed GLNC inside GL2NR. Right, how do I do it? So let's, I don't know what the best thing to do is. Um, so Um, how do I do that? So if I think about, so if we think about vectors, um, what I want to do is if I have a vector v1, v2, so, so the, the here is we need a notion of i, what multiplying by i means, right? Because here we've got complex things, here we've got real things. I'm going to think of the complex things as two by two real matrices, right? So what do we want? So say we got some vector, v1, v2, v3, v4. I can imagine mapping it in the following way, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0, times v1, v2, v3, v4. If I do that, so, you know, v1 goes to v2, v2 goes to minus v1. Probably did it exactly the wrong way around. Um, let's do it this way around. I'll put minus 1 there. Okay. So let's call this matrix I. So uh, if we pair v1 plus i v2, v3 plus i v4, etc., right, then multiplying, so then i is equivalent to multiplying by, by i, right? It takes v1 into minus v2 and v2 into v1 and so on. So if I've got this matrix, that then allows me to embed this inside here. Okay? And GLNC equals uh, matrices in GL to an R such that M I uh, M inverse is just I. They're the things that preserve this I. I'm just telling you how to pick out the complex subgroup. Okay, so that's the sort of just the local uh, thinking about the local the way that way the way the locally things in bed.
And you notice that i has the property, if you take i squared, it's minus the identity. So how do I think of this as a structure? So as a, G, as a GL and C structure, we get an invariant tensor I M N, right, which is like doing this thing, this object. So this is some section of T star M times so T M times T star M such that I squared is minus one. So just as for an orthogonal of the ON group, we could think of it as a set of frames, or we could think of it as defined by the metric. I'm giving you the analog of the metric. The analog of the metric now is this tensor I, one index up, one index down. If I have that I at each point, then, I could, then it defines a uh, set of frames. Um, So equivalently, we can have um, the subbundle P inside uh, FM, which where a given element here is a set of frames, and we can think of them in the following way. So let me. Uh, Right, I, and we think of them as some real part plus some imaginary part. So they're going to be like these vectors v1 plus i, v2. And they have the property such that if I act with i on them, I just get i times back the frame. So that's a way of choosing, now I've sort of complexified my frame, but it's okay. So this is a way of choosing the subset of frames that live in here. And again, this has a, this is, this, this is the existence. So this thing is called a, this thing's called a um, almost complex structure. This is the way usually a, in maths books, you see it introduced. Um, this almost is because the next thing we're going to do, in the next lecture probably, is talk about how you can put differential conditions on these structures. And those differential conditions are going to make this from an almost complex structure to an honest complex structure. Okay? So we're going to be interested in next putting some differential conditions on these things. Are there questions? What would happen for an SU structure? Let's, can you give me two sacks and we'll get there? Okay. So, so it turns out that this way of defining things in terms of invariant tensors is the more nat is the easiest way to do it, right? So my next example. Let's again do D is 2N, and let's consider an SP. OK, now there's a million different notations for this, but I'll say SPNR, the real symplectic group. This corresponds to what you might call an almost symplectic structure. So what do you have then? Then you have a two-form. This is the invariant tensor. And it has the property that it has to be uh, non-degenerate. 
that means if I take omega, which omega, which omega, and I do it n times, this will be a top form. This has to be non-zero. So this is the way you would define the symplectic group, right? So the so the uh, we would think of the symplectic group as the set of matrices in GL two N R such that M omega M transpose is omega, where this omega is a matrix that looks like minus one, one, zero, one. All right, this is the sim, um, and so the symplectic group's exactly the thing that leaves this invariant. It looked like the jet, the I, right? But the I was something with one index up and one index down. It transformed with M, I, M inverse. The omega is something with two indices down, so it transforms with like, M, M transpose. So they're different groups. And then so the question you could have a UN structure and if you think about it GL 2NR has a subgroup which is GLNC and it also has a subgroup which is SP2NR and if you set it up right the common subgroup here will be UN unitary matrices so for this we've got an I and for this we've got an omega so for a UN structure Same omega as I, because it's symplectic, so it's the same thing, two form that has to be invariant. Um, And so, uh, and actually, but to, to get the subgroups, for the subgroups to work, um, properly, right? So the embeddings have to work the right way, right? If I don't, I have to choose these two in a way, in just in the right way, so the common subgroup is, U, is UN. So UN is going to be determined by these two things. And for that to work, I need that if I work out this thing, M, P, I, P, N, this needs to be symmetric on M and N. That's a, that's a sort of compatibility. So if I didn't, if I chose omega and I that didn't satisfy that, then they wouldn't have a common U1, UN subgroup. But this thing I can just think about like a metric. So I get a metric. And I had to get a metric because UN is a subgroup of O2N. So because it was a subgroup, remember this thing was defined by a metric. So if I've got more structure, I must at least have the metric. I may have some other things. And this is the basis of Kähler geometry, right? So 
So we haven't got there yet because you have to put some extra differential conditions on, but just as G structures, a UN structure is the first thing you need when you want to do Kähler geometry. And then you could get more exotic. I can't remember what example I got up to. Six. So let's take D equals seven. There's the exceptional group G2, which is a subgroup of SO7, which is a subgroup of GL7. So I could also think about G2 structures. And they correspond to having an invariant three tensor, three form. which I'll call phi. So there's a particular three form that's invariant under G2 transformations. G2 is a particularly group. So it's a sort of very special case, right? Because G2 is uh, sort of naturally sits in SO7, so it's something very natural to seven dimensions. Should I tell you more about this invariant three form, how to construct it? Okay. All right, so to me, the way this way of constructing it makes tons of sense, but sometimes when I tell people, they go, what are you talking about? And it makes no sense to them at all. So let me try. So. What, what, what does this take? So um, write the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. And now think about knight's moves. So you jump 1 and then you jump 2. There are precisely uh, seven ways you can do that. You do this one, then this one. And then you just write down, so if you have a basis, E1, E2, all the way up to E7, then phi looks like E1, wedge E2, wedge E4, one, two, four, plus E2, wedge E3, wedge E5, So that's that triangle. And then you just keep going. E3 wedge, E4 wedge, E6. And what's the last one? Uh, e, sorry, I don't want hats. E7 wedge, E1 wedge, E2. So that's a way of constructing a three form. And under the GLD transformation that acts on the basis, it will be invariant under, this sub, under a subgroup, which is G2. So, um, So you can look, you know, if you, in my day, I would say go look at Slansky that tells you how to do all the group products. In your day, you go online and you look it up. Um, and, right, so there's a seven-dimensional representation of the G2. And so the question is, you want to find, you know, you want to find some singlets under the representation. So if you take wedge three of the seven-dimensional representation. You can go look up the representations and it turns out it has a singlet in it. So. All 
I should say, if you want to know where this is, another way you can think about where this is coming from is from the Octonians. Do you know about the Octonians? So the, right, you can have these division algebras, like the real numbers, the complex numbers, the quaternions, the octonions. The octonions, you can write numbers that look like z0 plus z1 e1 plus z2 e2 all the way up to z7. And the funny thing with the octonions is that um, they're not abelian, right? They're also non-associative. The product between them is non-associative. It's totally weird. But you have a product between these. So this is the analog of writing z is x plus i, y, right? The i I've now promoted, or if you do the, uh, if you do the quaternions, you have three things, i, j, k, right? So now I've gone from one to three to seven. Now I've got seven things. But I have to know what the product between these things are. So what's i, e, i, e, j? What's that equal to? It's equal to minus delta ij plus phi ijk ek, where this phi are these numbers. So one way to think about what the G2 group is, is the group that leaves the product struct, the, that leaves the, the octonium product invariant, because it preserves both this bit and this bit. Okay, so let me just, um, I want to do one more example, which is just to, well, let me do two more. <laughs> so, uh, example seven, so let's go all the way. So let's choose trivial G, that's just the identity. So that means I've just got one frame, right? Because each frame is related, each frame is related to another one by a, by an element of the group. So we just have a unique frame. So we just have a unique global frame. And this means this is equivalent to saying the tangent space, the tangent bundle is trivial. So if I take the tangent space, it's actually just a product with Rd, right? There's no twisting of the tangent space at all as I go around. And this is what, this, this is what we call a parallelizable space. And an example is a Lie group. So, you know that Lie groups are manifolds, that's the point, they're groups that are manifolds. And on a Lie group, you can take the left invariant forms, or the right invariant forms, so the, there's, a, there's a natural way of picking out a frame which corresponds actually to, what's, to the Lie algebra. So Lie groups are necessarily parallelizable. Parallelizable spaces are more general than Lie groups. But. Okay? And just to show you that you can get quite exotic, and sometimes, or this isn't very exotic, but sort of a bit different from the examples I've been giving so far. So let me give a last example, um, which is going to be which is going to be a foliation. So what's a foliation? So a foliation is a sort of sub-bundle. Uh, what should I call it? Uh, let's call it C. This is some sub-bundle of the tangent bundle with some fixed dimension. It's, it's actually more than this, but let's, let's think about it like that. Right? So if you think about it, what's going on is my, so I've got special vectors. So if I have a vector at a, at a given point here, if I order it correctly, I can think of the special vectors as being the ones that are like v1, v2, all the way down to vn, and then there's zeros for the rest. So that's like an element 
of this sub subspace. So I'm picking out a subset of vectors which, if I arrange it correctly, could mean that the first n components are non-zero, the rest are all zero. So what's the group that preserves C? So that's going to be something that looks like matrices that are going to have a sort of block form so they've got an n by n block here they've got a d minus n by n block here and a d minus n times d minus n block there but they better have zero there right because otherwise when I act on vectors of this form if it doesn't have a zero there, I'm going to generate bits down here. So this is some parabol. This is a, what's called a parabolic subgroup. Uh, I probably better not call it P. So if you have this foliation thing, that defines some G structure, which is. this funny parabolic subgroup, this funny sort of block triangular thing. So all I'm trying to say to you is that you can have structures which can have some fairly uh, non-standard groups appearing, not ones you're used to, like just ordinary simple Lie groups or something. Okay. Let's see. Okay, and let me just so let me just let me just summarize a little bit. So we've introduced these objects. So we have this. Uh, so let's summary. So we have this G structure, which is a sub bundle of the frame bundle. And typically, this is equivalent to some set of invariant tensors. So this was like G or I or omega, etc. Right? Doesn't have to be. This example um, doesn't have. doesn't have to have that, that one can also have it actually but no. so typically it's equivalent to some set of invariant tensors um, and the existence of P restricts the topology often right so All these structures I've mentioned, other than the, than the metric one, they only exist if the, topology of, if, if the topology is restricted. And in particular, it means that the structure group of the tangent space reduces to G. So when I patch my vectors as I go around, I can patch them using this subgroup. That's basically all this is. It's just saying that you can patch in this subgroup. And once you've got this, it also allows you to decompose tensors into G representations. So if I've got this structure, I can actually now decompose my tensors further. So, um, so for example, if I have the complex structure, the almost complex structure, so if I had the GLNC, I can take my tangent space, strictly speaking I need to complexify the tangent space, but I can split it into two bits, T10 and T01. These are the ones with plus eigenvalue, I eigenvalue, these are the ones with minus I eigenvalue. So if I take vectors here, 
I can act on them with i, either they're going to have plus i eigenvalue or minus i eigenvalue. That allows me to decompose tenth vectors, complex vectors, into two bits. Um, if I had, you know, if I just had the OD, the OD structure, well, if I took now symmetric tensors, I can decompose them into a traceless part plus the trace. So this is like traceless and the trace. So I'm just, you know, contract with the metric and pull out the trace. That's all I mean. But you could do it for any of these structures, right? You can further decompose things. And that's something we're going to use. All right, I guess I better stop. Um, so next time, having set up this stuff, the next interesting thing to do is to say, um, can I find nice connections on these spaces? So for on these structures. So for the case of the metric, you know there's the Levi Civita connection. And the property of the Levi Civita is that it's compatible with the metric, right? The derivative of the metric vanishes, and it has no torsion. So a very natural thing to do for any of these structures is to look for the existence of a connection which is compatible and torsion free. Sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. And the existence of a torsion free connection puts a differential condition on the structure. And they put us onto all the things that, we, that, that you see uh, all over the place. So if you ask for a torsion free connection on a complex, almost complex structure, it has to satisfy a differential condition that makes it into a complex structure. If you want to do the same thing for a symplectic structure, what happens is that that symplectic two-form becomes closed, and you get an honest symplectic structure. And those differential conditions are going to be exactly what we get from supersymmetry. Because the variation of the killings of the, of the fermions look like a derivative, it's the requirement that you can find solutions of those equations that put, put you onto these what are called torsion-free structures. Okay, so that's what I'll tell you about next time. Are there any questions? Yeah. Maybe could you give a comment on the spin structure? Yeah, good. So, um, so if you've got, so we had the ON structure, which was part of the frame bundle. Um, and then the point is, is that, you know, um, there's a spin group, <coughs> which um, is a double copy, is it, right? It's a double cover of the orthogonal group. So you've got a projection down from here to here. So the question is, is there some principal bundle which is now patched with spin that, I can, that projects nicely down to here? So this won't be a thing of frames anymore, right? But it's still a principal bundle. It's a sense there'll be objects that are related now by spin transformations rather than orthogonal transformations. So there'll be two objects here for every object there. So while you can always have this structure, that's because ON is the compact part of GLD. And when you twist things, you only see the compact part of the group that's, that, that matters for the twisting. So you can always have this. You can't always find some lift here. And the existence of the lift there is a spin structure. Once you've got the spin structure, then you can look for representations of spin rather than ON. For ON, you just had tensors. When you do it for spin, then you can also have spinners. So when at the beginning I said that when we did the supergravity, we really had a spin manifold, what that means is that it's a manifold that allows you to not only have a metric, but find this other principal bundle that lives above it, which is a spin bundle. And there's topological obstructions to that, which are these Steffel mini classes, right? So, good. Are there other are there other questions? Yeah. Um, <sighs> it's like the gamma matrices, if you like. That's probably a bad way to say it. Um, the not really. No. Probably a better way to say it. Because <laughs> it's got to go beyond the, st beyond the tensors, right? 
it's a sort of lift of something. So it's not going to be something that you see in a normal way in terms of tensors. Was there another, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. So um, right at the end, yep. maybe a little bit when you brought up the example of the music, you, you, you say here that, OK, the existence of the compatibility that you want is going to allow you to reduce the structure group yep. to the same subgroup of the thing you started with as you're reducing the fibers to. Mm -hmm. Is that obvious? Because I would say there's, you know, you didn't say anything about <laughs> comparing the subfibers at different points of the manifold. Right. So your, your question is, uh, if I'm understanding, there's two slightly different things. I define this in terms of principal bundles and reductions of the frame bundle. And I said it's the same as the structure group of the tangent bundle. Is that the point that's worrying you? Or no, something else is worrying you? No. Uh, I mean, for a principal bundle, you have two actions of the structure group. Yep. You have the one that just moves you through the fiber. Yep. But you also have the one that acts like a gauge transformation when you go to other points in the manifold. Yep. And the definition just talked about the first of those actions, moving you around in the fiber. But at the end, and also when you mentioned lead groups, you seem to claim that also having the I have the other one. says something small. OK, so the key, I think the key thing was that this embedded in the frame bundle. Okay. So I'm using the structure of the frame bundle to do exactly those sorts of gauge transformation events that you're talking about. So if I just thought of it as, as just some principal bundle, obviously I don't know really how it's changing as I move over the manifold. But the fact it embeds tells me how it changes. And that's, that's the, that was the cheat, I think. OK. Yeah. I hope yeah, that, right. is that, yeah. Are there other questions? But we are always considering principal bundles, right? Right, so when you want to think about uh, these G structures, it's always the, the nice way to think about them is in terms of principal bundles. That's the way that sort of allows you to unify all these different structures. So pre, right, you could also just say, OK, well, I want a complex structure, so I'll have this object. We'll do this on the tangent space. I have a different structure. So you could do each one separately. But the nice thing about the G structures, it sort of does them all in the same framework. That was the idea. Other questions? Uh, is it possible for G to be a discrete group? Uh, I think for all the things I want to talk about, we won't do that. But you could in principle, yes. There's no reason why not. Yeah, so it probably is a bit outside the way I'm defining it. But you could do, there would be, for example, on a um, Mobius strip, there's a natural choice of, there's a natural Z2 choice of frames. There's the frame and there's, there's one which is the reflection. So there is a natural way of having just a Z2 group at each point. Any others? All right, uh, I'll see you in a week's time.